Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, as National Diabetes Awareness Month draws to a close, we're chatting about the fight to cure, prevent, and treat diabetes with special guests, Timothy Doyle, uh, President and Chief Operating Officer of JDRF in New York, and Sean Kramer, Chief Executive Officer of the Diabetes Research Institute Foundation in Florida. So thank you both for joining us. It's just great, great to see you. I'm going to set this up and uh, just, just point out that over 34 million Americans live with diabetes and another 88 million have prediabetes. So that's about 37% of all of us. It's, it, it's a huge, huge issue. And in terms of financial impact, the di diagnosed diabetes annually costs us taxpayers well north of 300 billion, that's 300 billion with a B, in direct medical expense and reduced productivity. And that doesn't even include the 20% of diabetics who go undiagnosed. So this looks pretty serious to us, Tim. How do you assess the issue that, that we all face? I mean, 37% of Americans facing this same problem. It seems like we should be all able to pull together uh, regardless of political party, it affects us all, right? It does. And good morning, Mark. And thank you for inviting me to the show. Yeah, to break down those numbers a little bit more, it's staggering. And to some degree, it's understated. Um, if you look at the 88 million, roughly 10% of the United States population, or 35 million people, are diagnosed with diabetes. Of that, roughly 1.6 million, or about 5 to 10%, have type 1. Uh, but then there's the other roughly 88 million or so or more that are undiagnosed. And collectively, that amount of people places a great strain across, across the, uh, the healthcare system and financially across the economic system. The other thing I'll note is that is only in the United States. It doesn't speak at all to how prevalent this is across the world where those numbers are dramatically higher. Yeah, and, and, and if, if I'm in a room with, with 10 people, Three, three or four of those people either have diabetes or pre-diabetes, right, Sean? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, it, it, it is stunning. And I think what um, what is even more staggering is if you look at where the numbers are, are trending towards. I would say one of the things that we're, we're noting just anecdotally right now, and I'm looking forward to more research coming out on this, is, you know, every time um, you hear about COVID, uh, and the comorbidities attached to, to COVID, it's always around asthma, obesity, and diabetes, right? And one of the things that, that we believe from a research perspective is that uh, diabetes type one specifically can be triggered by a virus. So if you think about the number of people that have been impacted uh, by COVID and what's coming, I can tell you that the endocrinologists that are at the Diabetes Research Institute are already overwhelmed. And uh, myself as a type one took me six months to get an appointment to see my endocrinologist uh, just recently. So I think it's only going to continue to get uh, significantly worse. It's, it, it's so very interesting. We have uh, basically response to our currently in process uh, poll and um, uh, almost 60 percent of the people who respond say they're personally affected either to themselves, uh, a, a family member, a friend, a coworker. Uh, by this this issue, so let's let's talk a little bit before we talk about how we respond. Can we talk a little bit about impact for for different communities and and where the biggest impact is felt? Because since we also have a wealth imbalance in this country, and we see a greater and greater concentration of wealth and fewer and fewer people, wealth uh, covers a lot of sins, right? I mean, if I if I can uh, easily jump the line and get to uh, an endocrinologist, um, or if, if I even have access to an endocrinologist, I'm going to have a different life, right? And that's, it's, it, it's, it's really stunning. If, you, if you're in that room and you have, you know, four people who have diabetes, the two people who have money are going to have a different life than the two people who don't, right, Sean? It, yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, I think there there continues to be challenges if you look at at what happens in you know specific, you know especially around underserved populations and you know, we were talking earlier around food deserts, right? If you don't know what to eat or you don't have access to the right foods, if you can't afford 
insulin, um, which is just outrageous in terms of you know where it has gone and in terms of pricing, you do have a completely different experience with this disease. Uh, you know, if you can't afford a, a CGM, a continuous glucose monitor, and you're having to you know prick your finger you know six, eight, ten times a day, this is a different disease than than those that have the ability to go out and actually have, you know, insulin pumps or any of the technology associated with, with uh, living with diabetes. Tim? Yeah, I'll add to that. The gap is particularly wide in diabetes, and I'm still trying to learn why as I'm new to this organization. But, you know, JDRF, like DRI, is focused on access and affordability. And I often hear our CEO, Aaron Kowalski, talk about he lives here in the New York metropolitan area. He has access to great care based on where he lives in his, his affordability, but he don't only has to drive 10 miles away and you'll have the same people, same disease without that because of the ac- access being limited geographically in underserved areas. So that's an area that's very, very important to JDRF and the str- we're strongly advocating to improve that. So, I, you know, yeah, let me just jump in real quick and, and, and mention that we were just in uh, Georgia the other day and meeting with some families there and there are no pediatric endocrinologists in their area. They have to drive all the way to Atlanta or to Jacksonville to get access to, to care. Uh, you know, in, in, in this country, in today's day and age, that just should not be the case. Of, of Two, course, three hours uh, drive. And, and then if you take a look at the rural states, you know, Alaska, Montana, uh, those areas, right? Particularly this, this divide. And again, it doesn't matter if you are conservative or progressive or independent, you know, our politics don't, it doesn't matter, right? So many things don't really matter. If you have the condition, you need the access. We're asking a a question right now. It'll be interesting to see um, what people uh, think. And I'm going to, I'm going to uh, ask you uh, in terms of uh, diabetes and race, what races and ethnicities do you believe are most impacted by diabetes? Because there are, biological factors, right, that do, that went along uh, racial lines. And then it'll be interesting to see what people, what people uh, answer, because uh, I'm going to ask you for the real answer, right, in terms of, in terms of who's affected. But let's talk a little bit about how do we ameliorate those situations, Tim? If we see that there are imbalances and we are concerned about having a strong country across different areas, if we are concerned that people living in rural areas have uh, similar access, right? We don't, we have different lifestyles, so it's not gonna be identical, but that, that we consider our fellow Americans. Uh, what do we do about these kinds of uh, differences? Yeah, I'll only speak to a couple of these and I'll turn it over to Sean, he'll speak to more. But I think the first thing is increasing our screening. Uh, we are looking at how do we do better screening across all ethnicities and all geographical areas to proactively get at and identify where people are at risk. So we are supporting some programs that are getting after that. The other thing, quite frankly, is clinical trials. You know, there, as we speak, there are roughly 450 clinical trials going on. And we have a very challenging time getting diverse communities to provide, to sign up for those clinical trials. So we're strongly trying to, to get these pharmaceutical companies to put a benchmark on what percentage of their trials are people of color or other ethnicities who typically are underserved. Huge opportunity in both of those instances to start early in the, in the process at getting greater access and greater awareness. So this is really important because this, it isn't about race, it's about biology, right? Race is just a marker for biology, right? In, in, this, particular, in this particular case. So uh, let me ask you, we've gotten some answers on this issue of uh, which races and ethnicities do people believe are most impacted by diabetes. And we had a vast majority uh, thought that African-American were, were most impacted. And then um, there, were, uh, there were way fewer uh, people, 33%. That was 83%. 33% said Native American and, and uh, Alaskan Natives. And um, 17% uh, Native Hawaiian and 70% said, said white. So, Sean, do you have uh, any insight into, into where this clusters? 
I don't think I have a particular number in terms of where where it breaks down. Uh, you know, certainly in the African American uh, population, where you see you know high levels of obesity, you're going to see a greater number of of type two. But that you know, I think the the other side of this is that wherever you see obesity, you're going to end up seeing increases in in type two uh, diabetes. So I, I don't think it's it's race specific, Timothy. I don't know if you have a specific you know breakdown of of race uh, as it comes to well, on a per capita basis, on a per capita basis, way off the charts, way off the charts is Native American, uh, Alaskan Native and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander, way off the charts in terms of impact of, of diabetes, which basically speaks to your point, uh, Tim, that when we're when we're looking at at these kind of this kind of research, we do have to take a look at where these these conditions cluster. And then we can figure out how to treat um, in, in those communities. And of course, African-Americans are very, very well, uh, very, very heavily impacted. So how do we deal with this? You have you have the research side, Sean. So let's talk a little bit about the research. And uh, Tim, you've been you've been funding this research a lot. And then we're going to talk about the the non research side, the care side um uh, uh that that attached to this uh sean you want to talk, give us a run through of some of the newest research in particular yeah i'm happy to do that and i think you know the, the question that you asked earlier about how do, how do you ameliorate some of the issues related to diabetes and the answer is very simple you cure it right uh you know Take it away. Like, goodbye right it's it, it's done that solves all of the problems and that that is that has been the focus of the the work at the diabetes research institute all we are here simply to cure type 1 diabetes that that's it that's all we do day in and day out um so i i you know my my standard um you know speech in terms of what i when i meet people is i have one job and that's to lose my job so you know the 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 research that that we are doing and and you saw the the results as you mentioned earlier on the vertex trial um, as it relates to stem cell could therapy, you, could you just talk a little bit about that and just describe what 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 is going on there? Sure. So what what they've been able to do in this particular trial is this this company Vertex has been able to actually uh, develop uh, stem cell therapy um, that produces, or they actually are able to uh, implant those stem cells into an individual, and they've done it with one individual thus far. Um, and as I understand, they they uh, provided them with half the dose. Um, of what they would normally do or are looking to do in, in future uh, portions of the trial. And those stem cells were able to then in turn produce uh, insulin for this individual. And he was actually able to reduce his overall insulin usage by I think over 90%, 91%, which is not a cure, uh, but it certainly gets us uh, a further, well down the path. You know, there, there continues to be some challenges with that as it relates to, to um, you know, usage of immunosuppression drugs. Um, and so we're addressing some of those issues on, on our side at the Institute. So we have been a pioneer in, in islet cell transplantation, which basically uh, means that you take islet cells from a donor pancreas and implant them into an individual living with diabetes. And you try and protect those cells from the autoimmune uh, uh, aspects through encapsulation, things along those lines. But you're still dealing with, with the immunosuppression aspects of the disease. And so our team has been working now with, uh, we're hoping to go into uh, human trials uh, any day now um, through one of our researchers, Norma Kenyon, uh, with the drugs called an anti-CD40 ligand. And that will hopefully eliminate or reduce the need for uh, for some of these immunosuppression drugs themselves, which would be a great next step in terms of where the research goes. Um, that being said, we also have research that we're focusing on regeneration of the beta cells within the pancreas itself, so that there would no you know there would not be a need for transplantation. You can figure out how to wake up the cells that are within your own body you don't have to deal with the immunosuppression side. You have to deal with the autoimmunity side. So a number of different factors and, and, and areas that we're looking at. But, you know, as we've been talking about, we're trying to leave no stone unturned when it comes to trying to find a cure for this disease. And Tim, you, one of the things that I've always found really fascinating with JDRF as a major funder and as, as an organization that runs so many different programs is you have, you manage your, your, your initiatives like it's an investment portfolio, right? Where you're where you're trying to diversify your investments in order to maximize returns, optimize returns over a really broad area. Could you just talk a little bit about that part of your strategy? 
would love to. Uh, you know, we refer to it as taking many shots on net. Uh, we, we really want to make sure that we are targeting our research in a couple of key areas, but we, we want to diversify it to your point, take many shots on that, hoping that some of these will land a cure or a treatment. And, and it's important to note that we are so excited about the New York Times article. Uh, we've been funding Dr. Melton and his firm, Semmer, for over 20 years. So it's a huge breakthrough for the T1D community and for JDRF, to your point, we're now starting to see acceleration of treatment and ideally cure because of the millions of dollars that not only JDRF is, is uh, investing, but also others in the equity space or other places like uh, DRI and, and American Diabetes Association. And I'm going to stay with you, Tim. Um, uh, Jalen Walker asked a really great question, as usual, Jalen. People who know others who live with diabetes, um, are exposed to, to some of their pain, sometimes uh, nerve damage, um, uh, respiratory issues. There are all sorts of different issues. Um, uh, people lose uh, toes or, or, or whole limbs. Are there ways that, that we can ameliorate this without, um, you know, short of a cure? Um, we don't have a cure yet, um, or at least uh, we're seeing some hopeful signs, but we don't have it. But uh, Tim, how do we... How do we deal with this on a day-to-day basis? Sure. You know, I'm going to circle back and remind everyone of, of JDRS mission, which is to improve lives today and tomorrow by accelerating life-changing breakthroughs to cure, prevent, and treat. Treat people who currently have type 1 diabetes and its complications. So there's a huge education component to what JDRF supports and that's everything from local practitioners, teaching them the best practices for people who have diabetes, as well as trying to focus on the cure and the treatments. So we cover the scale of everything from trying to identify it in advance, folks who are susceptible to it, to treatments for cure, as well as treating those people who currently have it. Have so disease. first is education. You're saying the first thing you can do is learn as much as you can about the condition. If you know somebody, if you have it yourself, learn about it learn about it. But what other, so now that I've learned about it, what kind of response, what kind of actions can I take? Because that's really uh, Jalen's question. What, what can I do? So one of the first things you can do is, is reach out to the local JDRF chapter in your community. You know, we have 29 chapters across the United States who do everything from give a bag of hope to a newly diagnosed patient and pull them and their family into the JDRF tent where they get exposed to a community of support, as well as they can get directed to the best treatment options that are available for that disease. So uh, it really is a community that is out there to support and advocate on behalf of people and families who are dealing with this disease. And uh, Sean, uh, what do you think I should do? Let's say, let's say I just found this out and I've, I've, I've got, I've connected to JDRF, I've connected to your organization. I'm really connected. What can I do uh, tomorrow, like when I sit down to breakfast, um, what do I do? Well, certainly, you know, one of the, the I, and I agree with with Tim, you know, their their organization is second to none when it comes to education and, and really the resources that they they provide. Uh, you know, certainly in my own uh, you know, journey with diabetes, one of the most helpful things that I had was going to uh, see the nutrition counselor that we have at the Diabetes Research Institute. I know a number of of, uh, you know, hospital systems and, and uh, endocrinologists work with nutritionists and dietitians that can help you understand what it is that you're putting on your plate in the morning and how that impacts your own uh, experience with diabetes. So, you know, certainly getting the resources and the education is, uh, is, is paramount. Uh, but, you know, as every time you go to the doctor, they're going to tell you the same thing, right? It's, it's exercise and you know, make sure you're, you're moving and watch what you eat. Those are the two most critical things. Um, you know, when it comes to, to, to type one, uh, you know, a little bit different in terms of the experience that, that we have with the disease, because it's not just simply what we're putting into our body, but it's equally, uh, you know, how, how things like exercise affects your, your diabetes. So, you know, being mindful of that, but connecting in with a community, I think is, is critical. I think the other aspect, uh, you know, that, that, that Tim mentioned, you know, beyond just the care aspect, 
is to learn about what's happening from a research perspective. And if you yourself are, are a candidate or interested in clinical trials, we need more people in the cl clinical trial space to sign up and register. So, you know, go to the website, go to, you know, diabetesresearch.org and see what trials we have uh, coming up where we're partnering with a number of institutions across the country to, you know, to enroll patients in trials that we have and that, and that JDRF has as well. So and I'll add uh, that, you know, if I can, one of the things that we are doing at the local level is we are trying to use our chapters to engage underserved communities and again, both educate them, but also make them aware of where there are clinical trials in the community that they can participate in. So it's important that we start local and go, go uh, national. There's a lot about empowerment uh, in, in your answers, right? I mean, whether you are empowered by uh, being able to invest a small amount in, in a cure just by making a contribution of time or treasure or, or changing your diet, we, we're in the midst of a poll uh, which we say, do you make choice in your personal life that helps reduce your risk of pre-diabetes, type 2 diabetes, or even uh, help you live with uh, type 1 diabetes? And we have here cutting sugars and refined carbs, working out regularly, drinking water as a primary beverage, lose weight if you're overweight or obese, make healthy food choices, so fresh rather than processed, quit smoking, get regular checkups, and so on and so forth, adding to that the education, becoming educated in there, which we, which we did not think about asking, but it, but it was a great point that you made, Tim. Um, are, are all these things, as someone who lives with diabetes, Sean, are all these things uh, on the, on the uh, table? Is there anything that we have not um, added here in our discussion yet? No, I, mean, I think the only other aspect is, you know, especially if you have a history of diabetes in your family, I, I'm a fourth generation uh, in my family. So straight up my mother's um, side of the family, I, I thought I was going to escape it until I got diagnosed five years ago. Uh, but making sure that you're seeing your doctor on a regular basis to, to track and, and understand what's happening with your own body, that you're having regular lab work uh, done and, and, and taken so that, you know, the, the, the day that I was diagnosed, it was a, a, a shocker. Um, to me, I really, like I said, thought that I had had gotten over or, or away from the, you know, what you, you you think is the preconceived notion to, you know, to a type one diagnosis. And at, at 44, it hit me. Yeah, it's 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 really it's really interesting that um, we we feel immune until we're not. And then that sort of creates a, a an, an awakening of consciousness. Um, were you in the diabetes community before you got diagnosed? I was not. I, I had been in the nonprofit space uh, pretty much my entire career. Prior to this, I was the chief development officer for the Parkinson's Foundation. And it was while I was working at Parkinson's that I, uh, I was diagnosed, had all the symptoms um, you know, of, of, uh, of getting diabetes. And when I went in and, you know, I had unquenchable thirst and I had lost, you know, over 20 pounds in just about a week and a half or so, uh, my eyesight went completely blurry. And by the time I got to my doctor, uh, you know, my, my uh, glucose level was over uh, 450 and my A1C was at 11.7, which is, you know, just was, uh, was terrible. Uh, but, you know, I was fortunate to be able to find the endocrinologist at the Diabetes Research Institute got me on a really great, uh, regimen uh, on insulin and, and have been, uh, you know, I would say good since then. And that's, and that's self-empowerment. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, Tim, about what we can do for others who are living with, with diabetes. How should Americans respond? There's a lot of discussion right now about um, build back better and what we should invest in and so on and so forth. And of course, we're always investing in things that we need. We're investing in military. Uh, we're investing in, in uh, uh, extraction of resources that we need for industry. We're investing in all sorts of different things. How do we function right now in the United States? And do you believe that we function in a way that's efficient in terms of investing in, in research, medical research, deploying um, the, the product of medical research throughout the country, and in trying to bind the nation together in a way that is um, considerate of those who um, are living in places like, um, you know, major metros, Chicago, New York, uh, you know, Houston, and so on and so forth, versus places that are around the country? And how do we address this? Sure. I'm going to give you some simple answers that from a JDRF perspective, but then throw it over to Sean. You can get, probably give you more scientific answers. But from our perspective, the key thing is, is education and advocacy. 
you know, we're focused on not initially uh, long-term finding a cure, but well in advance of that, we've got to better educate the community that's out there, both at the, at the perspective of people who are impacted, but also advocacy on Capitol Hill to make sure that the right amount of funding is flowing into our organizations. For, uh, advocating at FDA to make sure we can fast track some of these treatments and cures. And then ideally, opening up a pipeline for additional funding coming into places like, like JDRF, either from individuals or, or organizations, so that we can increase not just our dollars going into research, but matching dollars from other organizations that will put more money into the pipeline, more shots on net, and ideally accelerate the cures that are out there. Um, I'll stop there, but let Sean add, add his perspective. I'm going to give yeah. you the, the last word, Sean, because we're coming to the end of our uh, end of our discussion. But but uh, I, I do want to ask you, Sean, uh, should we be educating people about things like diet, and should we be uh, you know kids, uh, you know maybe in in high school or even earlier than that on on conditions like diet? If 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 we're all affected, if we're all going to be hit by this by this stuff, and maybe there are other things as well. But but should we should we do a better job of just because I never heard about diabetes until I heard about it, you know, about from my grandparents. You know, I, I love to say that that we should be educating everybody on, on diet and exercise. I think that should just be part of what we do on a daily, daily basis. My ultimate goal is we should be educating people on why it's important to cure diabetes and what the long term impacts of curing diabetes are going to do for the overall uh, you know, community and, and, and society as a whole. Right. So for for us, that is that is the goal that eliminates the health uh, aspects and issues that, that people deal with. It eliminates Huge return on investment. It eliminates the problem with getting insulin. Right. I mean, the whole the whole supply chain of, uh, of the drug uh, goes away if you don't need it anymore. That's that's correct. So we're we're hopeful in, in terms of our ability to uh, to move the conversation in direction there, um, and uh, you know certainly appreciate the opportunity anytime we we have uh, to to talk about the work that we do and, and obviously JDRF does. So you know I want to say thank you to to you and and to Tim for uh, you know having us on today. Oh, it's great! It's great to have you, Tim Doyle, President and Chief Operating Officer of JDRF in New York, and Sean Kramer, Chief Executive Officer of the Diabetes Research Institute Foundation in Florida. Thank you so much for your work. Thank you for your work on the cure. Thank you for your work on educating us all. Thank you for your work on on uh, treatments. And and uh, please do thank your boards and your staffs for for their great contribution. Really a pleasure. Great. Thank Thanks you. so much. Take care. Stay healthy, guys.